In this video we're going to deal with public goods and services. Now public goods and services are usually considered under the heading of market failure. Uh, these goods and services cannot be supplied through the market mechanism. So our supply and demand analysis cannot really be applied here. There are various reasons for this as we'll see as we go through this video. And the reasons mean that uh, the market system is not appropriate for the production and supply of these goods. In the market economy goods and services are produced for profit and purchased by final customers. So in the market economy it's, it's quite straightforward. Companies produce goods, producers produce goods and customers buy the goods and they buy them through the market system. The price is determined through the interaction of supply and demand. The market brings the individual producers and the individual consumers together so that they may exchange the ownership of the goods from one person to the other. So the producers, let's say, they, the companies make goods, make, make good and ser goods and services, and then supply these in the market. And the customers enter the market and make purchases of the goods and services, and then they possess those, or to possess the benefits of them. So there is a transfer of ownership within the market. The the companies own the products until the products are sold to the consumers. So the market transfers ownership. Some goods and services display, display the characteristics that enable many customers to enjoy their output and not diminish the quantity available to other custom, uh, consumers in the process. So some goods uh, enable many consumers to enjoy them and perhaps enjoy them simultaneously and at the same time the more consumers that, that participate in the enjoyment of these goods it doesn't diminish the amount available for others. So it sounds like magic really but there are goods which we call public goods that are not diminished by consumption. They have special characteristics and they are known as public goods. We must distinguish them very carefully from private goods. Private goods are the subject matter for the market economics, for supply and demand and for trading and, uh, and ownership passes from one person, from the producer, let's say, to the consumer. In these situations with public goods, this does not apply. These are different goods and they have different characteristics. There are two conditions that are necessary for a good to be classified as a public good. The conditions are non-rivalry and non-excludability. So if goods have these characteristics, non-rivalry and non-excludability, they're classified as public goods. This makes them special. This makes them special for, for us because they mark these goods off as different from private goods which are sold, as I said before, on the, on the market. Now, we'll talk about non-rivalry and non-excludability in the coming slides, but just for the moment. Non-rivalry means that consumers are not rivals for the consumption of these goods. And non-excludability means we can't easily exclude someone from receiving the benefits of the goods. Now let's look at these in a little more detail. We'll start with non-rivalry. Now this characteristic of the good enables the consumption by one individual of a unit of the good or service uh, not to stop another individual from consuming the same unit. So if someone consumes a unit of, of service of a public good, that unit of service is still available to someone else to consume. Now, that may be difficult to accept, but 
if one person enjoys a public good and is in a sense consuming the public good, enjoying the use of the public good, it doesn't diminish the amount of the good that's available for someone else to to enjoy. The good is not diminished through consumption. It may seem impossible and is certainly not a characteristic that is present in most products. If an indiv individual consumes a cheese sandwich then no other individual can also consume that cheese sandwich. So for the cheese sandwich we are rivals. If one person consumes the cheese, cheese sandwich then the cheese sandwich is not available for anyone else. It's gone. We'd say that the cheese sandwich by the way is a private good. We're here talking about public goods. The goods we're talking about, if one person consumes an amount of, of this public good, it doesn't diminish the amount available for someone else. It's not like the cheese sandwich. The cheese sandwich, when someone consumes it, it's gone. It's not available to anyone else. So we are rivals for the cheese sandwich, but some goods we're not rivals for. With public goods, for example, the consumption of street lighting or defence, the consumption of one more unit of that product by an individual does not diminish the amount available to other consumers. So when the defence force is supplied by a country, uh, I'm protected, but so are you, and so is everyone else. And I can't increase my consumption of that good. Um, it would be difficult for me to do so. The fact that I'm here means I get the same protection as you or as anybody else. People who are flying from one country to the next and who stop over in an airport here in the UK, let's say stop over at Heathrow Airport just to, to change planes. Whilst they're at Heathrow Airport, they are being protected by the Defence Forces. We're not rivals for the services of the Defence Forces. We're not rivals for streetlights. The streetlights are supplied. If, if I go out tonight and coming back the lights are on, I, I enjoy the streetlights. I enjoy the benefits of the streetlights. It's not something we often think about, but but I enjoy the benefits of the streetlights. I like the, the fact that there are streetlights. Me enjoying the streetlights does not diminish the amount of streetlights available for you as well. You may go out and enjoy the streetlights as well. It may sound like a, a rather silly example, but streetlights are there. We are not rivals for the services of the streetlights. We're not rivals for the services of the defence forces. Some products, some services exist that we're not rivals for in the same way as we're rivals for the cheese sandwich we're rivals for items in a shop the concept of non-rivalry only exists up to capacity limits however for example we're not rivals when driving on the roads late at night because there are very few cars and lorries on the roads late at night so the roads are relatively open and free and uncongested. So we're not rivals at night. But during the, the day when traffic builds up, then we are rivals at that time. So when the rush hour appears, we become rivals for the roads. So this idea of non-rivalry exists uh, unless there is a capacity limit. And for some items there are capacity limits. I mean the amount of roads is limited in supply. But at some times the roads are uncongested. Sometimes the roads are very congested. When they're very congested we're rivals. When they're not congested we're not rivals. So this idea of non-rivalry applies to some goods. The defence forces, street lights, and we can go through several items that are produced typically by the government 
uh, they're, they're produced by the government and we enjoy them because we're not rivals. Now let's look at the, the other um, characteristic of public goods, non-excludability. This refers to our inability to exclude others, uh, other consumers, from the consumption of the good. We can't stop people enjoying the consumption of the good. We can't exclude people from the benefits of the good. Once the good is provided, everyone benefits from it. So it's difficult, if not impossible, to exclude people from benefiting from the defence forces or street lighting. Uh, once the defence forces are supplied, we, we benefit. We can't be excluded. It, it would be technically very difficult to exclude us. From street lighting, the government would have to have a curfew, lock us in our homes. And that way we don't benefit from street lighting. But that's not practical. Not uh, benefiting from the defence forces means we would be... Uh, very difficult. We would have to be moved on to a little island somewhere and we'd have to tell the world that this island is not protected by the defence forces. Not, again, not practical. Silly. So, it's difficult, if not impossible, to exclude people from benefiting public goods. There is another side to this characteristic, non-excludability, because it implies non-rejection of the good. For example, a pacifist, somebody who doesn't believe in the defence forces, somebody who doesn't believe in the military, a pacifist is being protected by the defence forces, like it or not. So the pacifist, who rejects the concept of, of having a defence force, is being protected by the defence forces, like it or not. So we can't reject the good. So we can't be excluded from receiving the benefits of the good and likewise we can't reject the good. I could say that I reject uh, the idea of streetlights. I reject that streetlights should be supplied. But they are supplied. They're there. Here, he or she is being protected, the pacifist, is being protected and also cannot be excluded from the services of the defence force. So the pacifist is being protected, like it or not, by the defence forces and can't be excluded from the services. So non-excludability implies non-rivalry. Uh, sorry, it implies non-rejection. Non-excludability implies non-rejection. So we have two attributes, non-rivalry and non-excludability, and these determine whether a good is public or private. If we have non-excludability, we have non-rejection. So we've now got different characteristics associated with goods. We've moved away from our simple idea of uh, a company pro providing goods and services onto the market. Uh, we, through the, the forces of supply and demand, determine the price and we trading on the market. These are private goods. We've now got this extra dimension of public publicness. Where both rival, non-rivalry and non-excludability are present, we say that pure public goods and services exist. So if we have non-rivalry and non-excludability, we have pure public goods. Now the word pure here suggests that there is a gradation. There is a movement away from, from pure public goods down to private goods. There is a, there's a movement away. So pure private goods and services do not have either of these characteristics. Pure private goods, we are rivals for the private goods. We have to... Uh, commit our own resources and work and get resources and then bid for the goods and try and acquire the goods through the market mechanism. And we can be excluded. Once we've got private goods, once we've bought the good, we can exclude others from it. Uh, if, if, if someone buys a car, they can exclude other people from sitting in the car. It's their car. It's a private car. But there are a range of variations 
uh, between the two extremes, between pure private goods and pure public goods. So we have uh, some which are falling into a grey area in between pure public and pure private. Let's look at something called the, the free rider problem. Non-excludability may mean that consumers uh, attempt to free ride. In other words, to enjoy the consumption while avoiding the cost involved. So if we can't exclude people from benefiting from the public goods, then they, they may try to avoid paying for it or contributing towards it. So let's say uh, a country does not have a defence force, just pretend, and the government decides it needs a defence force, but it's going to finance it voluntarily. It's going to ask people to make donations, make, make contributions. Now some people may really want the defence force. They think it's a good idea, they want to be protected. But they can now lie. They can lie and say that they, they don't want the defence force and in that way avoid paying. This will have implications for the ways in which uh, the production of public goods and services is organised and financed and controlled. You see, if people deliberately misrepresent their preferences, they want the public goods, but if it's done by voluntary contribution, they can lie and say they don't want it, knowing full well that others will contribute and the good will be provided and they will benefit from the good when it's provided and they did not have to pay. In other words, they become free riders. If public goods are financed by voluntary contribution, the consumers may deliberately misrepresent their preferences and say that they like, dislike the goods when in fact they positively desire its provision. So people lie about their preferences to avoid paying. By lying in this way, they hope to avoid paying and become free riders. For this reason, if public goods are to be provided, they cannot be financed by voluntary contribution. Otherwise, everyone may become a free rider. And if everybody becomes a free rider, the good will not be provided. Everyone says they don't want the good, when in fact they do, but they're hoping that other people will pay. If that happens, everyone becomes a free rider and the good will not be provided. So for that reason public goods are generally supplied out of coercive taxation. The government forces us to pay taxes for the provision of those goods and services. Now of course this opens a much bigger debate which we're not going to get into here at this time. We will look ahead later. Uh, <laughs> What goods and services should the government supply? So we have coercive taxation to make sure that the goods and services are provided. It's just the problem is what goods and services? The defence forces, well, non rivalry, non excludability, we can see that. Um, perhaps street lighting, we can see that. But uh, the provision of libraries. Now we like the idea of libraries, but are these public or are they private? Or are, where are the, the, the rest? Can we exclude people from benefit, benefiting from libraries? Well, yes we can. We can tell them to go away. We can stop. We can close the library. We can stop people entering. So can we exclude them? Yes we can. Are people rivals for the services of the library? Yes. The more people that uses it, the less books are going to be available for others to borrow and if one person borrows the book it's not available to the next person. So we are rivals. So with libraries we're rivals and we have uh, excludability. So it's not a public good. Therefore should it be provided by the government? In fact the government doesn't have any money. The government's only got the money it can take from us by force through taxation. 
So should the government provide libraries or swimming pools? In fact, what should the government provide? What goods and services should the government provide? Now clearly it fails on these criteria. It's not a public good. We have all sorts of goods in between, quasi probably goods and so on. But in terms of uh, what the government should supply, this analysis raises lots of awkward questions. Let's move to uh, another related area. We can come back to this debate uh, in, in later sessions and in, in later classes as well. Uh, it's a big area and it's a very important area, very controversial area as well as you can see. A lot of people will disagree over a lot of the material here. Let's talk about what's known as externalities. Now externalities are uh, these are external to the market. These are events or consequences that are external to the market. If you like, they're goods or services that are external to the market. They're not traded. These were identified by Alfred Marshall, who is really the, the father of modern economics, uh, the, the person who, who first uh, matched supply and demand to find how the market worked, uh, and gave us modern economics. Well, in the Principles of Economics in 1922, he identified externalities and external effects, the external effects of our behaviour and, and the way we live and work and so on. And this became an important area of discussion. An externality exists whenever, due to the nature of the present economic and social uh, insti institutions, costs are imposed on others for which no compensation, compensating payment is made. So, if someone inflicts a cost on us and there's no compensation paid, that's an externality. Let's say, classically in economics, the example was, let's say a company is producing something and it, it, it needs a lot of water to produce this item and it takes the water from the local river, it takes it in, it processes its item, and then it puts back out the waste water back into the river. This water going back out is now polluted. And the, that polluted water floats down the river. Then let's say there's another producer down the river who needs clean water. Well, they can't get clean water because the water's been dirtied by the first producer. So they have to take the water out and clean it before they can use it. <clears throat> so in other words, the first producer is inflicting an externality, a negative externality, on the second one. It may also be producing an externality for people who enjoy using the river, for anglers and swimmers and people who enjoy the river. And the person who, or, or the company that's doing this, is not compensating anyone for doing it. For this reason we may need the government to step in and get the, the company to take responsibility for what it's doing and, and compensate people who are affected adversely by its behaviour. So costs are imposed on others and there's no compensating payment. That's an externality. It could be that sometimes benefits are bestowed on others for which no pen, uh, payment is received. Sometimes people benefit from situations, but they don't pay for it. It's an externality. People may benefit from, uh, say, from education. Now, we send children to school. People grow up, they go to college, they go to university. Uh, they become educated. <clears throat> now should society or should the government make a contribution towards education and the payment of education for education? Well are there benefits from education? Well in a sense they are. Uh, the people who go to universities and become highly qualified they get jobs, they get good jobs but they also pay a lot in tax. 
and that tax that they pay into the future in the future will go perhaps to help other people so education has perhaps a positive externality associated with it that the country is benefiting and individuals within the country are benefiting the society is a better place people are more compassionate and more understanding and more polite and more helpful people are nicer because they've been educated so perhaps there is an onus to make some payment towards education to compensate or, or to acknowledge the benefits that are going to come back from education um, it is debatable whether education is a public good or a private good and I know this is a very controversial thing to say but in terms of the analysis that we're going through here it means it's very difficult to decide can we exclude people from education yes we can the laws relating to education are man-made laws they're not laws of nature and man-made laws can always be changed but can we exclude people from education yes simply tell them to go away so we're excluding them are people rivals for education yes the bigger a class size the less service each individual student will receive so students are rivals for the services of the tutor the services of the institution and they're also they can be excluded so they're not public goods so why should taxpayers contribute towards education towards supporting education well the only reason is presumably that there is there are possible positive externalities possible benefits that will flow in in the future as a consequence of having an educated population higher rates of economic growth more prosperity for the country higher tax receipts so hence there may be some obligation to make a contribution towards education Ed externalities are untraded or sometimes called non-traded interdependencies and there's there's an interdependency between let's say the companies I gave you the example with the the river the classic example of one company polluting the river there is an interdependency the second company needs the water it needs clean water so the second company has to incur the cost of cleaning the water before it can use it so there is an interdependency the second company is disadvantaged by the activities of the first company but there's no compensation paid there are two types of externality positive externality uh, it's when we receive benefits but no payments are associated positive externality could be from education the example I gave you earlier um, we benefit from having an educated population we benefit by having higher rates of economic growth we have better products we have better services from companies and um, we have a more compassionate society a more understanding society a more helpful society so we do benefit from education so education has is a positive externality the fact that people are going to university today and going to college today and and undertaking training programs and so on it seems like I don't benefit from that these are too remote but in fact I do benefit from it and so do you so there are positive externalities there are also negative externalities when costs are inflicted on the other without compensation being made uh, the back to the, the the river again negative externality it's sometimes somebody's behavior imposes a cost on another person really we can interpret this very widely if um, if your next door neighbor decides to have a party with very loud music that ranges on for a week so you don't sleep for a week that's a negative externality it's a non-traded interdependence it could be internalized the externality maybe the neighbor comes out and and asks you for permission to have the party or perhaps compensates you offers to pay for you in a local hotel 
for a week and, and gives you some compensation for the inconvenience. So the externality could be internalized. But in the absence of that, that is a ne negative externality. The neighbor has done something to inflict a cost on you without compensation. There are also technological and pecuniary externalities. Technological externalities, the consumption or production activities of one person or company may affect the levels of consumption or production by other people or companies. So sometimes the production of activities of one person may affect the levels of consumption or production of another company. Um, Sometimes, for example, uh, companies may pollute the atmosphere, pollute the local area. So air condition is very bad and locals are affected. The company simply builds a chimney and puts uh, fumes into the atmosphere. In a sense, it's a technological externality. It's a negative externality. So a company may pollute the air that the res residents uh, breathe and no compensation is paid. Pecuniary externalities. Well, this means uh, that it's related to money. Pecuniary is associated with money, money and pecuniary. For example, when the activities of one company inflicts costs on another company without compensation. Back to the river. Uh, the company who polluted the water gets the benefit of clear water. It clean water, it takes it in, pollutes it, puts it back in the river. The second company has the cost of cleaning the water before it can use it. And then it puts it back into the river. Hopefully it puts it back into the river clean. But the second company has a pecuniary externality. It's, it's a negative externality. It's associated with the activities of the first company and the first company does not compensate the second one for its activities. So the second one has higher costs as a consequence of the activities of the first company. Now, social costs. These spillover effects or externalities give rise to the notion of social costs and social benefits. That's really how we, we talk about them. Since externalities are external to the market, Therefore, they are examples of what we call market failure. They're outside of the market. They're external to the market. So they're market failure. Economists have spent a long time trying to think of ways of internal externalities. In other words, getting the market to solve the problem. But it seems as if more and more uh, the solutions seem to be getting the legal system involved and, and getting companies to take responsibility for their production and not inflict costs or harm on others. When markets fail there is a role for the government to intervene to regulate the market and provision of the goods or service. Um, when markets do fail, when, when we have situations where uh, the activities of one company affects the uh, success or failure of another company, when it influences the cost of another company without compensation, maybe the only way to deal with that is through the legal system, as I said. Maybe the second company can bring an action in law against the first company and try to get the first company to become more responsible. So to this end, the government tries to regulate behaviour so as to bring about uh, solutions to this problem of externalities. So if your neighbours do have an all-night party or a party that lasts a week and blasts out loud music that keeps everyone awake, maybe the police force could stop it because there doesn't seem to be a way in which the market can cope with that one. Um, it's unlikely your neighbour will compensate you and put you up in the hotel, like I said, or, or give you some compensation for the inconvenience. So maybe the only way to deal with it is through the legal system. This particular video is somewhat controversial. It deals with 
very very blunt points points that often uh, we try to not even think about but we're here talking about capitalism we've talked about the allocation of resources about the market mechanism and supply demand and, and so on and it was time to deal with other types of products where the market is not successful in allocating these products um, we have got public goods with uh, non-excludability and non-rivalry it's only when we have rivalry and excludability have we got the market but when we've got the market we've also got issues associated with um, externalities these are outside of the market actions that are outside the market but which impinge upon others and that can impinge upon them negatively or positively now in the context of market failure there are other ways in which markets can fail and this will be the subject matter of other videos in in this uh, area and it's important that you look at this one understand the concepts here but also look at the other videos because the topic of market failure is much wider than I've got here here I've only got public goods and externalities but there are others like failure due to information and then there's failure due to uh, all sorts of issues that need to be taken into account um, from monopoly onwards but there are many other issues and it's important that you look at the other videos to get an insight into those and make your own notes pad out your material do some research and become familiar with this whole area it's a very important area it's very controversial and it's it borders it overlaps with politics to some extent but nonetheless it's one that we should consider and we should be aware of but that's all I'm going to deal with in this video so thank you for watching